During the period of time between the closing of Monthly Animal House and Berserk's continuation within Young Animal in 1992, conceptualization on a character similar to the main character of Berserk started to take form. Although not a direct inspiration, these two characters would travel similar territory over the course of their runs, have actively fought against the machinations of fate, and suffered for it. Men with a goal to kill monsters that threaten the world's safety, who kill what goes bump in the night with a single swing. The difference between their creators and their intentions may differ, but each has had a profoundly similar effect on its readers. Not to mention their publication through the same North American publisher, both being key but important parts in that publisher staying afloat. To properly explain my point about comparing these two series in such a way, I think I'd want to first walk you through their origin. December, 1944, the Scottish countryside. A platoon of soldiers led by 1st Sergeant George Whitman stood watch in an abandoned church by the shoreline. With intel from the British Paranormal Society, aka the BPS, about Hitler's alliance with the satanic Slavic wizard Rasputin, the American soldiers kept watch until... CRASH! Out of a bolt from a cloudless sky, the platoon and BPS members bore witness to the arrival of... a key. A key to end all things, a seed of destruction that will bloom into the apocalypse. However, the lead of the BPS's investigation, Dr. Trevor Brutenholm, makes a startling observation about their enemy. They're a child. As their enemies scatter from their altar miles away from the coast, the platoon realizes that this thing they've encountered means no harm. For the sake of national security and studying the creature, the platoon decides to harbor the creature for the foreseeable future. A future cursed with, regardless of anyone's actions, the demise of mankind as we know it. Almost a demon, almost a human boy, Dr. Brutenholm christens the seemingly harmless monster as Hellboy. Buddy, I don't have another one! I think Hellboy is beautiful and often understated in what it's achieved. Obviously, its legacy in movies and video games has cemented Hellboy, at least the Del Toro version, in pop culture canon. Hellboy has a history dating back to one of the most important periods of Western comics and lasted long into the digital age. Whenever I see someone's a fan of Hellboy though, the comics are not really the focus of the conversation. What it is, it's often with a weak smile and arms raised and a shrug. I've never read the comics, are they good? And if they have read some of the comics, it's often followed by condemnation from its creator, Mike Mignola's association with his editor, Scott Alley. A man worthy of scorn, to be sure. I still believe, however, that this series, at least the core Hellboy books and the spin-offs necessary to understand its original ending, are worth exploring for modern comic readership, especially those looking for similar emotional depth and edge as Miura's dark fantasy Berserk. So, this is my way of selling Hellboy to you! To that fan of edgy, life-changing, beautifully drawn manga that wants to challenge themselves to read left to right, this is why Hellboy is worth your time. With some light spoilers here and there. I think the most important factor to judging your enjoyment of Hellboy is your opinion on Mignola's artwork. Like Mignola's career as an artist spans four decades, not only evolving in terms of art style, but also visual storytelling. The shading is the most distinctive part of Mignola's art style other than his tendency to draw men with heavy shoulders. Or slouched. He does fight scenes here and there for the sake of tension, and at times uses the medium of comics to great effect, but a lot of Hellboy's best moments are its most quiet and atmospheric. Its intimate conversations and sad little diatribes. And also the memes. Love them. Keep them coming. There are other artists that join Mignola's side for various stories, such as Richard Corbin, who has done a whole bunch of the main Hellboy issues. His style compared to Mignola's is vastly different in terms of detail and shading, but that change in style isn't bad when it's still Mignola writing the story. It's certainly not for everyone, and very different from Miura's, but that level of detail and clear love for the craft shows. Hellboy is a treat, in more than one way. I mean, have you seen Ron Perlman? Like, not just him as Hellboy, because I think you get that by now. Have you read Ron Perlman's filmography? Have you seen his performance in Drive? Yes. That is one motherfucking fine-ass pussy-mobile motherfucker! You know he was fucking slayed? 
Yeah, dude, I fucking love Ron Perlman! Hellboy is, well, a demon. Half, at least. He's the son of a great demon he doesn't know the name of, a human mother he never knew, and was raised by the Bureau of Paranormal Research and Defense. Formed in the wake of World War II by Professor Brutenholm, who I'll now prefer to as Professor Broom, its goal is to combat occult threats across the globe. Through the BPRD, and sometimes alcohol, Hellboy investigates reports of monsters of all kinds and strange, sometimes emotional tales. I'd like to call this early period his Black Swordsman arc, because some of the same elements are at play thematically. A status quo of their place in their world and their intended purpose in it. And while we don't have a God Hand or Griffith, we do have an ancient prophecy in Rasputin the Immortal Wizard. For you see, Hellboy's existence is part of a bigger plan, the big hook to Hellboy's journey. He's told that he is destined to help bring about the end of the world, something that Hellboy really doesn't want to hear. And something he'll learn very quickly isn't something he can deny. Throughout the early stories, Hellboy is joined by a growing cavalcade of allies from the BPRD's Growing Special Talents Task Force, such as the intelligent fishman Abe Sapien, the pyrokinetic obvious love interest Liz Sherman, and eventually in his own personal journey, Roger the Homunculus. I know there's Daimyo, I know there's more to the BPRD in their solo series, but I want to focus on the main Hellboy book in this video and maybe do that in another one. You do not need to do that much homework in order to read this, I promise you. The world of Hellboy calls heavily on myths and legends from all kinds of mythologies, but over time Hellboy becomes embroiled in the machinations of various groups and deities that all vie for their own goals, all while Hellboy is forced to process personal discoveries about his past and his place on Earth in the present. It's a part of Hellboy I don't think is necessarily unique in comics given its basic concept, however its execution makes the biggest difference. Every part of Hellboy's journey does build upon itself, building a tapestry with a world bigger than him going on in the background. Forever doomed to conflict from denying his true purpose, the prophecy will go on with or without his approval. I'm not going to spoil much more than, at the end of an arc featuring the ghost of a superhero from the 40s, a Nazi brain in a jar, and... the Conqueror Worm. Hellboy leaves the BPRD. It changes the trajectory of Hellboy's journey, and the quality of stories that Magnola ends up doing is just the embodiment of a chef's kiss. Hellboy, in very small but discernible ways, reminds me of Guts and his journey. Sure, his circumstances are completely different, but that same stoic sad chat energy I get from them is undeniable. This idea of a person growing up in a place that provided him no other option but to learn to fight, to work for a greater cause and become disillusioned in it with age. They're both introspective about their circumstances, claiming to do things their own way or live life how they want to live it. Their worlds are unforgiving, but both trudge on regardless. It's life-affirming, despite the pain and debatably unsatisfying endings. Which leads me to... Unlike Berserk, Hellboy has a somewhat inconsistent chronology if you haven't done the tiniest bit of homework. Luckily, people have made lists in the past as to what's essential for fully understanding the world and general journey of Hellboy. I'm using the Multiversity Comics list with occasional interjections as to what are my favorite stories, as well as help from the Hellboy wiki as to what's in chronological order. Because while there are arcs in the same way there's Conviction or Falcon of the Millennium Empire, some of the best Hellboy stories are one-offs that are far off the beaten path. The major Hellboy solo series can be right in order of the first two omnibuses, Seed of Destruction and Wake the Devil, and Strange Places. The first omnibus is Mike Mignola really discovering his voice in the general direction for the Hellboy character. The first story of Hellboy is actually scripted by John Byrne before Mignola felt comfortable enough to write himself, occasionally inserting his own dialogue and word balloons that complemented Byrne's. In canon, the prophecy is set up, the sidecast is fleshed out, the origin of Hellboy in the Right Hand of Doom is slowly but surely studied, also, Lobster Johnson. Just... Lobster Johnson. It's fun. It's well drawn, but it's certainly the status quo version of Hellboy people would expect. Then, well, strange places. I say that this is the book where Hellboy changes from a standard, albeit novel, story for the time about monster hunting and pseudo-cape shit storytelling, as I'd like to coin it, into the moody and existential Hellboy I kind of adore. Hellboy in Africa is such an iconic period of Hellboy's story and a true turning point in terms of quality. No more BPRD, no more procedural adventures, now every threat going forward is focused on Hellboy and his fate as the Destroyer. And then from here we need to take a detour. 
Although Omnibus 3 does feature the story that's most important in this particular era of Hellboy, there's another arc's worth of Hellboy wandering a foreign land with a bottle of booze by his side I want to talk about first. Hellboy in Mexico. This series of stories not only adds texture and lore to the world of Hellboy, taking place during Hellboy's drunken journey through 1956 Mexico, but also introduces a key player or two that will be referenced much later in Hellboy's run. There's a wrestling match with a zombie luchador, a run-in with a baby Frankenstein, Hellboy even gets married to a woman damned to hell for practicing the dark arts, but still. Hellboy in Mexico is just fun. It's what I recommend to people more than Seed of Destruction to understand the vibe of Hellboy as a series. The second most important tale I want to highlight before diving into hard plot spoilers is the corpse. Not only is the corpse a favorite for both Mignola and his fanbase, it's essential reading for the third omnibus onward. Setting up the world of Fae and Hellboy's greatest players in a seemingly normal case, the corpse is almost a prologue to the Wild Hunt and greater prophecies told in Hellboy's story. I mean, who doesn't enjoy Gruagok's shenanigans? Love that pig boy! It's also just one of the best things Mignola's drawn? Distinct designs, fun paneling, a simple but fun quest for our dear boy from Hell, it's another story I'd give to people looking to find out what Hellboy's about at its core. The many colors and shapes Mignola paints with when telling his story. Now, these stories are the essentials in between volumes 2 and 3, but there is one more story I'd want to mention. Hellboy, The Midnight Circus. Taking place long before the events of the main book, it's a beautifully drawn work by Duncan Fregretto, which focuses on a young Hellboy exploring the world outside of the BPRD for the first time. More foreshadowing for the future takes place within this book, so it is required reading, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. We very rarely get to see young Hellboy in the main book, and it helps develop his relationship with Professor Broom just enough to add weight to future moments. And now, without further ado, Book 3, The Wild Hunt. Continuity is the name of the game here, as antagonists seen long ago start slowly creeping back into Hellboy's life. The return of Hecate, the goddess of witches forever linked to Hellboy after being reincarnated during Conqueror Worm. The unraveling of more of Hellboy's destiny through the introduction of the Osiris Club. Gruagok's return and his murder of King Dagda. The Fae converging in their search for a new queen of witches. Even the young girl Hellboy saved during the corpse. Everything comes into play. Even mentions of the BPRD's pursuits during the growing chaos in the world outside of West Europe. The world is in peril as the Queen of Blood, Nimue, hearkens the coming war that Hellboy cannot ignore his part in, whether he wants to or not. This is where things not only become heavier, but the world feels older. Hellboy feels older. It feels like in many ways the culmination of Hellboy's wandering, his attempts to deny what was in front of him until it screams right in his face. Hellboy's relationship with the Osiris Club and their search for a king is just as important as his relationship with Alice Monaghan in this arc, the very same infant Hellboy saved during the corpse, which is... weird, given what happens with them. But it wouldn't be a berserk comparison without bringing up problematic elements. I feel like this arc is comparable to that of Conviction, at least the final third, or Falcon of the Millennium Empire. The paradigm shift of Hellboy's world hereafter is different from the one we've been in before. And where this arc inevitably leads, though, is probably some of Mignola's best work, but I may have to spoil something in particular to have the title of that arc make sense. After learning he's the direct descendant of King Arthur, and the rightful king who will die in combat with the Queen of Blood, Hellboy pulls the sword from the stone and pays the Baba Yaga, a long-running antagonist to which Rasputin owes his mastery of the mystic arts, to take him across the battlefield to face Nimue himself. After Nimue frees the primordial dragon Ogdru Jihad and basically causes Ragnarok to occur, Hellboy defeats Ogdru Jihad in one of the sickest fights in the series. As this is happening, the BPRD are dealing with their own situation, and as Superman says about issues like these that require more time than you're willing to put in, that's over there's problem, and over there has to stand for itself. Essentially, Hellboy slays quote-unquote the dragon, and from the dragon's chest rises a ghostly version of Nimue, her actual body being dragged down to hell. Which results in, well... What the Hellboy in Hell is the culmination of Hellboy's solo series. Every drop plot point is tied up, every prophecy fulfilled, and Hellboy finally confronts the fate he sought freedom from the day he was summoned by Rasputin. 
It's truly fantastic work, and although the ending to this arc and to the main solo series may be a little confusing at first, it ties into the overall message that Hellboy was all about. Hellboy, in short, is about defining who you are in a world that's labeled you otherwise. It's about fighting back against the inevitable and embracing it in your own way when the inevitable finally comes. It's about Hellboy's self-discovery and sense of identity he's gained throughout his life, his travels, and his friends. And in what remains of Hell after his rampage, Hellboy has found some kind of peace. There was solace in accepting his fate, despite how hard it was. And just because you followed the path set before you, doesn't mean it wasn't worth the journey. This, for many, is the end of Hellboy, and it feels like the right place to end it, at least for me. I read all this and got a pretty satisfactory package, comparable to the emotions I felt reading Berserk in one of the greater indie comic franchises I've enjoyed. The story of Hellboy doesn't end here, though. Oh no, there's a direct continuation, something I'm making a point of to state the big difference between Berserk and Hellboy. Hellboy actually ended. BPRD The Devil You Know caps off everything in the Magnoliaverse in a nice little bow. Hellboy rejoins his friends for the final stand against Ogdru Jihad and the Ogdru Hem, resulting in the loss of most of Earth's life. The dragon is defeated not by our main heroes, but by the Osiris Club's machinations off-screen, and Hecate, who stated that it would be both her and Hellboy at the end of the world at one point, is finally proven right. Liz burns the earth clean of impurity, Hellboy's blood becomes the water that fills the earth, and frogs rise as a dominant species on New Earth. Hey, remember frogs from the beginning? Yeah, it all comes full circle! That's basically the most simplified versions of events I can give you because other than being a fitting end to Hellboy's story and complementing his self-actualization in his solo series, the rest of the required reading is yours to choose. I think the ending in the solo Hellboy series is truly all you need, but a lot of people who want the complete package deserve the devil you know in their lives. It's the only point of differentiation I can harp on with Hellboy compared to its contemporaries. However, it's still a complete package you can rip into as you see fit. So, if you're looking for something to fill that void Berserk left you, something that lasted just as long and has a strong emotional core behind its mood lighting or square heads, Hellboy is your solution. It's an epic that traces an entire world's complex lore into the journey of a man's self-discovery through consistent trials and tribulations that would break most other people. And he does it with such gusto and nonchalance, I can't help but love the guy. Hellboy is a lot of things. A touching indie darling, a series disgraced by a harmful editor, a fun way to explore the Monster of the Week formula, and in a small way, something to remind yourself maybe you should move past your self-loathing and acknowledge both what you can't change and what you most certainly can. I find Hellboy to be an inspirational piece for all it's worth, something worthy of praise I don't see it receiving nearly enough of anymore. So go forth, explore, understand that even though Miura is gone and his story may never be finished at least by his hand, doesn't mean good stories don't receive good endings, or any endings at all. Some stories just end, and the rest of us are forced to move on with the good times forever with us on our journeys forward. And I think moving forward is the best thing you can do. Thank you for watching.